once I started putting my love for everybody else in that process into me, it suddenly started to click because then I started to appreciate the value of looking after myself properly and kind of working out what it was that I wanted rather than what I thought I should need based on other people. If I was just lying down, having my allocated rest, I would be thinking about how I was feeling. I would be stressing. I would be having lots of fear thoughts, you know, and that wasn't resting. You know, it wasn't in a restful mode. I didn't know the difference before I got sick. I had no idea what the difference was. And so learning that, learning how to rest my whole system was like the biggest factor. When I was constantly in this pleasing and overachieving mode, I wasn't me. And I feel that more and more that I will never go back to the person I was. I'm more like finding my way towards the person I actually am. Hello and welcome to another episode at the CFS Health Recovery Podcast. We have a very, very unique and special episode for you today. This episode was actually recorded only for our paying members, but it was so good and there was so much tears of gratitude and happiness from all of our members and I personally loved it. I had chills down the back of my spine talking to these three amazing individuals sharing their recovery stories with us and their five top key strategies that helped them the most. It was so good that I actually asked them, is it okay if we share this with the public because I think it's going to help them a lot too and they all said yes. So can you please, please, please thank them so much. If you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to this on a podcast, go over to the YouTube channel and give some love in the comments to these guys. They did not have to say yes. They did because they care, they're amazing people and they want to give back. So please sit back and relax and enjoy this episode. Give this video a like and a comment to say thank you and your biggest insight and takeaway from this entire session. This is one of those episodes that you'll want to listen to five or six times. It was so powerful and profound and has helped so many of our actual members move forwards with their recovery faster as a result of this guest panel workshop. So please sit back, relax and enjoy this episode and we'll speak to you very, very soon. Bye for now. What we're going to do tonight, we've actually selected five of the most popular questions that you guys asked. We did a little survey about two weeks ago to submit your question and it was very hard to select all of them. They were all amazing. But what we did is we ran it out to the five most popular ones. And what we're going to do is kind of workshop it together with these three amazing people. Before we get into it, I'm going to bring on our guests. So uh, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction and then we're going to get into it. So girls, what I want to know is if we can do it this way, how young are you? Where are you from? Where were you at your worst? And where are you now? We'll just do like a minute and a half and then we'll get into it. So Jessica, my friend, where are you from? I'm from Sweden but I have been living in Norway for the last 22 years. Amazing. How young are you? 43. At your worst, where were you? At my worst, I was pretty much, I wouldn't say bed bound because I could take care of myself in the house, but I couldn't go to the shops. I couldn't go grocery shopping. As soon as I stepped outside the door, the stimuli was just too crazy. It was pretty much house bound. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah it was yeah mm. where are you now what are you up to these days well i get a little bit emotional to think about the whole progress uh, i am still working on like completely fully recover i still am living a life where i have to be considerate of how i live but it's a massive difference this summer we're just at the end of summer here in Scandinavia. And this summer is actually when it all dawned on me, just how big the progress has been. What yeah. I have been doing during this summer, that I've driven like 500 kilometers on my own with the dog and just camping and shifting oh. places and meeting people. And it was just even in the springtime and I thought like, how much progress did I actually do in the program? I didn't do as much program progresses him or her did but this summer it just blew my mind 
So now I'm working in my business, uh, trying to step even more towards that. Yeah. Uh, my dream is to be able to completely be self-employed, 100%. Yeah, I know on Instagram you had an amazing holiday overseas as well with a girlfriend. I think that was a few months ago. That looked epic. That was kind of what sparked the whole thing. And then business-wise, you sell skincare products. And what else do you do? I teach yoga, yin yoga and restorative yoga and everything that is exhaling. Now I'm holding three courses a week and then all the admin around it. Yeah, so it's a huge progress. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. stoked to have you here. Can't wait to hear what your answers are to some of these questions. Thank you. Charlie. Where are you from and how young are you? I'm 53 and I live in the middle of the UK. So I live in Northamptonshire. On a beautiful farm that her and her husband renovated completely. Yeah. And yeah. you did that during <laughs> the recovery program. It was like a metaphor for the recovery, to be honest. Yeah, it was just yeah. Yeah, literally brick by brick. <laughs> at your worst, where were you? Just very low grade, low level functioning uh, probably like a one or a two out of ten if you like I was never stuck in my bed but certainly I just stopped I couldn't function properly I couldn't work I couldn't look after my family I just existed rather than anything else really it was yeah pretty poor to be honest how, how many kids do you have we have five children between us Charlie was in a bad way and she was in a very frustrated state and it didn't matter what I said. And the, I was trying to go from every single angle. She's like, I hate this. I don't want to be in this. This is bullshit. Something like that. Along those lines, does that ring a bell, Charlie? <laughs> and your progress has just been so amazing over the years. We've worked together. Actually, Charlie was one of the first people to join the mentorship program. So this new program has been running since 2013 online, but we completely changed it and transformed it to what it is today. And Charlie was one of the founding members where are you at now? And obviously through these questions, they're going to learn about you and you're going to be able to share your experience. But what are you doing now? You've just renovated a freaking amazing house. What else? So now I'm just kind of consolidating and accepting and I'm just enjoying being well enough to just enjoy life and work out who I am and what I want and manage my lifestyle so like Jess you know I'm still in that stage where I pay attention because if I don't look after myself then my body is like who, who do you think you are I mean this weekend we hosted an engagement party for my son and it was a massive weekend physically emotionally and I did it and I practice underwhelment that's my new favorite word I don't even know if it exists just to have joy because I was so angry because I felt so ill and so depleted my yeah. husband had to push me up the stairs because I just had no power. I completely lost all of my power. And, and it was really depressing, actually. Really it, was, it was a really tough time. And I remember when we did our success interview a while ago and you said, it's like your husband's dating a new person. How does he deal with this healthy, vibrant woman yeah. now who's got energy and life? And so that was a really interesting... And boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that. No. We'll talk about that. <laughs> All right, amazing. Thanks for joining us. Good to have you here. And uh, B, where are you from? Where are you living? I'm from Oslo, Norway, um, and I lived in the UK for 12 years, and now I moved back to Oslo. Ah, cool, amazing. And you joined the program years ago, 2017, I think it was. So you did the old program, which was really cool to have you here. How young are you? I am 32 as of two days ago. I still uh -huh. have lots of balloons all over the floor because I'm a very young 32 at heart. <laughs> <laughs> so good. The, at your worst, where were you? So I couldn't do a lot of the things that I was used to doing, right? I was working, but I was working like an hour every other day. <laughs> so I was like clinging on to doing little bits of things that I could do about 10 minutes of very slow walking, but I couldn't go to grocery stores and things like that. Socializing was like limited to maybe half an hour. <laughs> I was lucky that I could do little bits, but it didn't feel like that. And I remember the first time going through the whole doctor process and one of them said to me like, oh, but you're so lucky because yours is quite mild. And I was like, well, 
I can't work, I can't see my friends, I can't travel. It might be mild on the spectrum, like I'm very aware now how lucky I am, but when you feel like you've lost your life, it doesn't feel mild. So I think, because mm-hmm. I notice this tendency I have now to be like, well, you know, I wasn't fully housebound or bedbound. I think I'd been at that point about six to eight months after I'd gotten sick and then I found you and we had a chat and I remember I was just so desperate for the one answer I kept mm-hmm. saying, but should I cut out all sugar is this the thing I should do I kept asking for like the one thing so I had that desperation of like finding the one thing that could save me very quickly that was the same one uh, simple thing and a very quick fix please <laughs> amazing I just had a memory one of your goals was going to a yoga class and yeah. you didn't go the whole class, but you worked up to it in your daily routine. And then I think you went to half a yoga class and you built up to a full one. Is that right? Yeah. So I had, that was one of my goals. You're right. And I was yeah working up at home. Then eventually I had a yoga class at home. So I got the teacher to come to me and then I was working on the other different components of getting to the class with actually going to the class. I would go to the yoga studio, see the door and be like, cool, I'll go home now <laughs> and then build up. Yeah. You built up. Yeah, it was amazing. I remember that it was a huge win. Just quickly, because I want to get right into the questions. Where are you now? You've just published a book. Go on, show us your book. We want to see it. Yeah, I've yeah, got a book. I'm please. sitting next to you, a stack of it, which is very exciting. You've got a stack. So it's a novel <laughs> uh, that I started about the same time as the program. So it's, again, kind of like Charlie was saying with the house. To me, that book has been that project that kind of happened throughout my recovery. Recovery was small steps to build up, but small steps to build up. And so it definitely also feels like that was definitely a big part of my recovery journey. But yeah, I'm living in Oslo. I had COVID a few weeks ago. So at the moment, my energy level is like a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. But again, in context of it being a little bit lower, last week I went on a work trip to the Netherlands for three days and then I went home had one chill day and then had a christening and a birthday party in the same day <laughs> and was awake until like 2 a.m and felt absolutely fine the next day so yeah. yeah I think it's a good reminder actually for me at the moment quite crazy when I compare against where I used to be totally like a healthy person would which I'm really keen to talk it feels like there's a conversation coming out of this already between you three so I can't wait to kind of go deep Crew, are you guys ready? Like I said, we're going to choose the top five most popular liked questions. Let's get into it. So question one, if you were to go through the healing program again, what would you do differently or not at all? I think this is a great question. I'm going to throw it to you because I feel like you've got a lot of experience with this. Well, I would definitely listen sooner and I would be less resistant. I think I had to really sort of stop and forget about the things that I thought I knew and the things that I thought I should and the idea that I might you know be right about something and just really sort of step back and accept that I perhaps needed to have you know an open heart to different things resistance I think I I felt like for a little while that I was really playing chicken with myself I don't know if that resonates with people but I really was attached to my old way of life and I really struggled to let go of the things that weren't serving me because they were so comfortable and you know that's how I'd lived my life for so long so yeah I think that was it it was just that sort of just settling in and learning to trust myself so would I do it again I would just do it I would just I don't know but then I wouldn't be here doing it the way I'm doing it now if I'd have done it differently so I think we just sometimes we just have to sort of accept ourselves and trust the process and just let ourselves kind of feel what we need to feel mm. so I guess that's two different answers to the same question which is mm. probably not very helpful no it's right it's it's true because on one hand you know there's the old you mm. on the other hand there's the new you that you want but you're so stuck in the old you and the comfort yeah. of that yeah. and the frustration there's a pattern there that you, you just yeah. can't break through but I do remember specifically when you got that breakthrough and it took a while, it took a real long yeah. time. It was a hard yeah. slog. It was, Charlie did a lot of work, but it, it was felt like a really heavy slog, didn't it? Because I was so attached to my old lifestyle. And that's when, you know, when I talked before about, you know, the Justin having to kind of be with a different sort of person, because my values have changed, you know, and I have friendships that perhaps you, you go out, you go drinking, you do X, Y, and Z, you know, your friendships are built on that certain way of life or the things that you had in common and kind of actually that wasn't a healthy person I wasn't a healthy person and I think but 
you know, it took me a while to kind of just think that actually I'm kind of okay to do me. I just need to trust that process. Mm. Yeah, there was a letting go period. Too. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Patience it was massive. And I think, you know, B said something about that idea in your head when you suddenly think, well, was it that bad? Or, you know, am I bad enough? Should I be doing this? Or should I be feeling this? And yeah. Constantly questioning yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there was definitely a tug of war. Amazing though, what happened when you let go, you had stopped thinking that you knew everything and you just took on the coach's advice and really took it yeah. to heart and then made changes. It was like a different person was born. Change happened, you know. The guys, you know, just to FYI, Charlie's with us for over two years working together. Yeah, fully committed, like not stopping halfway, just like fully committed to however long the process was going to take. And when the timing was right and she was ready to fly wings, she was ready to fly wings. Hey, B, what comes to mind for you? I mean, a lot of the things Charlie said definitely applies here too. <laughs> the one thing that I remember was just groundbreaking understanding for me, and it took a few months after joining the program, was the fact that if I overdid it cognitively, that was as bad as overdoing it physically. That took me a very long time to understand because... I think at least for me, I had finally, once I realized I had to, you know, stop pushing and crashing, I focused so much on the physical side and not pushing and crashing there because I'd been very active before. So that was something I could kind of understand, right? Like it's kind of, okay, if you're injured, don't run. Like I could understand that mentality, but that I was also a very active cognitive person and am now, but at the time I didn't understand, well, if I'm lying on the couch, but I'm on my phone or laptop all day, <laughs> then, well, that's also massively pushing yourself. Mm -hmm. And then I would crash and I wouldn't really get that link. So that took me a while to understand that, you know, that's the equivalent of going for like a run, <laughs> just mentally. So you're not moving, but actually your whole system is expanding a lot of energy. So yeah, kind of just as you said there, Toby, like pinpointing kind of invisible secret energy drainers that I hadn't really figured out. <laughs> I'd say that's one of the big ones. I love it. Energy drainers and energy gainers and just becoming aware of what they actually are. That's brilliant. Hey, Jess, what comes to mind for you when we're kind of talking about this conversation around what would you do differently, if anything at all? The first thing that came to mind was I would have eased up on the immense pressure I put on myself. I came into the program and there was already this vault of material. Uh, all these videos and that like Charlie mentioned an old pattern of mine to kind of get it done be really really good at it and just amping up the pressure on myself and it probably took some months before I kind of eased up a little bit around that and found a way to go through the material in my pace so I would just to keep it short and sweet just you know exhaling a little bit more and taking the pressure off myself to get through all the material and be a really, really good recovery person, you know. Yeah, yeah. Jessica did our baseline program first, the five-day workshop, and then she came straight over and we did a success interview. Or, no, you filmed a video, a success video for us. And the first thing you said was, the first three months, it was like I stepped on a train that was already going. It just took me a while to find my place on the train inside the program. And I love that analogy because it can feel overwhelming when you start something new. It's like, oh, shit, ah, it's all too much. And it's like, no, you need to focus on your next right thing. You know, that's what we talk about now. It's like you just focus on the next right thing. You do that. You do that with full commitment. Once you've got it, then you can move on. Exactly. The small steps. But I also felt, I think I shared that in that video that you speak about. Also, I did feel like for the first time, <clears throat> I was on that train and the train actually had a direction. It was overwhelming. It was a lot of wagons on that train, but it, it, it had a direction. Totally. And nothing's perfect. You know, I think that's the key. Sometimes you got to throw yourself in on that train that you want to go on. And it feels uncomfortable, just like Charlie said. Like, I think we all think that like when we do something, it's going to be so perfect and easy. <laughs> Every time, like, it doesn't matter how many times you go through something, it's like, really? <laughs> oh, this is a can of worms. What was the biggest game changer that you did for your recovery? 
<laughs> we might need like five hours for this one. No, I'm joking. Jessica, I'm going to throw it to you first. I feel like something clicked for you around the three month mark inside the program. What comes to mind for you when you realize, you know, oh, this is actually really a game changer for you? Yeah, well, to repeat it again, that's when I kind of lowered the pressure on myself and I also relaxed my nervous system a bit more. Mm -hmm to be able to take in the information, but there's so many. I think that's a tricky question because it all kind of one step led to the other. Like it was kind of where I actually started was the sleep. And when the sleep was getting stronger, then it automatically led to the next step and the next step. So it's really hard to just say that's the golden nugget. It was just a lot of nuggets. And I started with sleep and listen to all your advice on, on that to, to stabilize the sleep, the sleeping patterns. And when that kind of, yeah, I think that will have to be my answer actually. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that was the thing that really, it, it was your approach. It's not what you do. It's how you do it. You know, I've said this from day dot, it's not what you do. It's how you do it. Shout out to Dr. Lionel Lubitz, who said that to me like 19 years ago, and he was spot on. It's not what you do. It's how you do it how you go about it. Yeah. Same experience that Charlie kind of went through too. B, what comes to mind for you? I'm sure you've got some juicy answers there as well. Oh, so many. I think the first one was probably the fact that there wasn't going to be one thing, which is kind of what I alluded to at the beginning, that I kept chasing this one big game changer, which actually what it was for me was to realize that, you know, if you do all of what I started calling extreme self-care because I would think of them as kind of formal standard self-care practices, but it was like doing it dedicated every single day, no matter what. And that actually believing that that could add up. And I guess I only really started believing it once I'd first trusted and tried to do it. And then I would see that actually my symptoms would lessen a bit and they wouldn't be as bad. I think that was probably the biggest game changer. And then once I'd gotten there, it was again, that implementation of I think most of us would have quite early on heard this thing of avoid pushing and crashing and being more stable. I'd heard that long before I joined the program, but actually what I thought was holding back wasn't holding back. I was still going way beyond my max every day just because my max seemed so low. So it was so easy. Like if I went for, you know, I used to run like half marathons and stuff. So if I was doing a park walk for an hour, I would be like, oh, I'm being really relaxed. I would just come home feeling nauseous and like I was about to collapse. But, you know, I thought that was the relaxing thing to do <laughs> until I realized that's not the case. And actually pushing and crashing, you have to go way back. Yeah. Way back, but also it allows for more consistency. Well, exactly. And again, that mindset shift, right? Of kind of to what Charlie was saying, learning how to reframe things. So like it wasn't going backwards. It was going forwards by doing less which wasn't going backwards at all. And it was, yeah, trusting that if I did that for a little while, then eventually I would get back to you. Yeah, where I want to yeah. be. I see so many people struggle with this. It can take them months to get to this mindset shift of actually realizing that, hey, what, because you're wasting months and months and months by not actually just doing it and by sabotaging yourself back and forth and, oh, but I don't know, oh, what if, no, if you commit fully, and do less is more, but way more consistently, which means you're going to progress faster. You're actually going to get there quicker. And that's kind of, you know, what she's sharing here. Yeah. And I love that mindset shift. So you're comparing yourself to your old self, which you just can't, you have to compare right now. You just have to start now. You know, there is no comparison. Let's just start where you're at and move forwards. Charlie, what comes to mind for you? Thanks so much for sharing me. That's really awesome. For me, the game change was when I started to value myself because then I started to trust myself and allow myself to be more consistent to not apologize for the decisions that I was making to help me to recover. So that would be tied up in my boundaries as well. But it was massive. And I know it sounds really bizarre, but just even to be able to like look at myself in the mirror and smile at myself and say, this is okay. You can do this. You're doing the right thing. Yeah, that was my game changer, I have to say. Toby, can I add something? Those two things that came to mind with the boundaries that Charlie mentioned, because me before all this, I had no boundaries. It's like a lot of pleasing, 
a lot of being really good. So the boundaries was a huge thing to actually say no, even if it freaked me out every time mm. you had to say no, but that did a lot. And also to not go crashing down. When I had symptoms from my body saying, this is a little bit too much. I went into a spiral, I panicked. I had all these catastrophizing thoughts like this is it. Now it's <clears> going to be the dark room and all that. But also the big change came when I started to just feel like, okay, I need to rest now. That was a bit much, so I'll just rest. You know, just that kind of softening mm. on that also. Did you ever doubt that you could fully recover? How did you overcome that and maintain the belief that recovery was even possible? No, they didn't have any doubts at all. No, none, zero. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, Toby, I literally had those. <laughs> Hopefully you're human. I think you are. Love to hear your answers on this one, girls. Jess, you, you laugh, what came to you? <laughs> mm. The thing was, when this first happened to me years ago, I had like a small, small feeling because I knew chronic fatigue syndrome, I knew ME, and I kind of had this small feeling that it's not chronic. There is a way out of this, but a million times over during these years, I thought to myself, this is it. I've crashed permanently now. I'm never going to get out of this. So those things came up, even though I had that little belief, it's not chronic, there's a way out. There was a lot of that thinking that this is it, I've ruined it now. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So I think to get over it, I think it's just to see the small results on the journey. It's to see that I didn't end up there. I was convinced that I'll never get out of this room now because <clears throat> I needed to rest in darkness and complete silence. But I did come out of that room again and again. And, you know, eventually I didn't have to rest in that way. And I think it's just a matter of the progression and seeing the changes and then starting to believe that there really is a way out. Really, really. Yeah. And I would just add to that. I think the accountability, like being in the group and sharing your win yeah. every single week, like imagine if you didn't have that. You know, seeing other people do really cool stuff and you go, oh, well, that's just proof right there, you know, and just surrounding yourself in that proximity of power, I think is just another thing that, again, just helps everyone, but it helped you specifically as well, you know, through that journey. Absolutely. The relating, mm. the relating to each other's stories and the support and just knowing we're on kind of the same journey, even though everyone's journey will look different. So, yeah. Mm. Mm. Cool. B. What comes to mind for you? Definitely lots of doubts. I was just thinking again about my initial most ambitious goals that I could think of was like to walk for half an hour, maybe an hour and go to yoga class. That's not full recovery, right? Those are amazing things. But given that those were like my dreams and my goals, clearly like that's how far my belief would let me believe that I could improve is what I'm thinking now, which is really interesting to think of, right? And so definitely lots of doubts in terms of, I think I always believed in improvements, like that seemed a feasible thing to believe in, but full recovery, I think I always said I did, but I don't think I did for a while. But then just like what Jessica said, that was it for me too, right? Every single little improvement, eventually you'd realize, okay, well, if every single little improvement, you continue to build and build and build slowly, they will add up to what eventually you can call for recovery. So I think that was the big thing. And then I would also say I did a lot of like self cheerleading, like every day I wrote down this list of daily wins to remind myself because sometimes the progress is, it seems almost invisible, right? And I would trick myself to make everything a win. If there was something I really wanted to do and I did it, I would celebrate that. But also if I, actually wanted to do that same thing, but I could tell I wasn't ready for it. And then I didn't do it. That was also a win. Yeah. So that made almost everything a win. So every day there was a lot to celebrate because if you did it, great. If you didn't, great. That meant you needed to rest. And so I think that helped me keep believing that I was making the right choices and progressing in different ways. And, and absolutely also Toby, what you said, like having role models of other people that had done it before was so helpful yeah I just think that's was incredibly powerful for me to see yeah. that other people 
even just like not even people that had fully recovered but people who were just like a little bit ahead of me I yeah. found even more helpful because I would be like okay I can relate to get to your stage you know <laughs> mm-hmm hundred percent. For me, I just want to quickly go back over one very powerful thing. And some of you might have missed it. My belief was limited to the progress that I made. And it's all in hindsight now, but the fact that you thought, okay, that's my top limit. That's the end goal is the 30 minute walk and the yoga. You could only get to that ceiling because that was the ceiling that you set for yourself. And so where in your life are you believing something that you're setting a ceiling for yourself? Now, I'm not saying it's true that you're going to go beyond that ceiling, but wouldn't it be helpful to have the potential opportunity to go beyond the ceiling? One of the best things I ever learned from a coach, I set a goal once and I said, you know, I'm going to get here. Like this is the, this is the top. And he said, no, 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 that's the minimum. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're going to get here as a minimum. And then you're leaving more room for more if you want more. And I was like, wow, that's powerful. So there's, you know, I love that. I love what you shared there, Be Super, super powerful. Super powerful. Charlie. It's just tough to answer when there's like such good answer. Okay. But oh, it makes, no. I'm sure like you're probably relating and going, yeah, that's spot on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, so for me, I think part of this was, you know, this whole kind of stubborn nature of myself was I just refused at the beginning I really hated the idea that people were telling me that I couldn't recover it really pissed me off mm. so I was determined but then I always trusted that process because I'd kind of come across you and I trusted you and I trusted your story and then through the mentorship you know having that community where I had that support to be able to ask the question but is this as good as it gets? Because that for me was kind of like, okay, so I've, yes, I can see that I've recovered to some degree, but it wasn't enough. You know, I kind of wanted more. And of course then, so those doubts that of course they come in, but that community for me, where as Jess said, you know, you're hearing people's stories and it resonates and therefore you see their wins. And then that's kind of, yeah, that's possible. And then that gave me hope. And Weirdly, and this is when I said at the beginning, when I saw that B was here. So when I had my last crash, probably because I hadn't been listening to my body. And I don't know if you remember, Toby, I went to Vegas. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> you were so excited to go on a holiday and you were, you'd made some good progress, which was great. And then you yeah, just yeah. to be a person in Vegas who has a Vegas time. And then you came back and <laughs> you felt horrible. It was like the end of the world. And I was like, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. No, but when I look back, you know, I think, well, how did I expect my body to kind of enjoy that process? I'd gone on the back of a cold and it's an entirely, you know, so all of that kind of stuff. But what I did when I got back was I watched B's success interview mm. and it was just incredible because I just suddenly thought, you can see in my, you know, we do the daily planner thing. You can see the change in my perspective from like before and after. And it just really galvanized me, you know, with my wins and my gratitude and all of those things, which are the things that got me through when I doubted my recovery. Exactly the same as Jess and B was gratitude wins kind of perspective type thing. Patience, trust, you know, all of those, all of those small things that when you put them all together. I think Jess sort of said, you know, there's like little nuggets everywhere sort of thing. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking, going back to the belief thing, you seeing those people doing better than you or further along than you, not better than you, because that's not a good way to look at it, but further along the line of where you would like to be, that's just confirming your belief for you, the possibility for yourself. It's opening up the door, well, what's possible? And we do take it for granted because it's so organic, right? It's like, it's in our faces. It's people we follow on Instagram. It's people on YouTube. And it's like, you know, we all have that person that we look up to. Well, that actually just creates the opportunity for you to allow yourself to think beyond your current limitations too. I was just going to say, I think for me as well, it's that, you know, that whole kind of curious over conclusive is so, so important for me. And that idea of, you know, you were talking before about these like limiting beliefs and just, well, well, actually, what if, what if I can do that? Or what if that did happen? And it makes such a difference. Totally. I just want to say this too. These three people who are sitting here right now were so proactive in the program in terms of communication with other people. 
I'm remembering right now, B used to do posts in the Facebook group, the old Facebook group that we had, the inner circle. And, you know, you were sharing and you were commenting back on people. You were really engaging. Charlie, you know, you built some amazing long life friendships at CFS Health. And it was because you showed up every single week and every month and connected with people. Jeff, same thing, always commenting, sharing wins, but also, you know, receiving help when you can, but also giving help when you could too. You know, there were so many times that your name would pop up in comments and messages. And so, you know, I think that can't go unnoticed too. So if you're someone who's in the program right now and you might be a bit reserved or you might not be making that effort, it's something to think about because you get what you give. It's yeah. okay to be vulnerable. I think it's a safe place to be vulnerable in mm. this community and mm. vulnerability is that process of reaching out and learning from other people because that everybody is kind of in the same space. You know, I would never go on a call without somebody saying something. I thought, oh, gosh, I didn't know I had that question until somebody else asked it. <laughs> always the way always the way when you were just so over being sick alone and isolated and just wanted to give up and couldn't cope mentally any longer how did you get through that jessica you look like you want to say something go for it don't hold back i had this tool i'm still using it i could use it even more often but i had this tool when i was really in that dark place when I really thought like there's no use all this is hopeless I took my journal out and I just wrote all my anxiety and all my sadness out on the paper like really every word and then I turned the page and I started with writing dear Jessica breathe I always thought like that. dear Jessica breathe and then I kind of just clicked into like a wiser part of me and I just wrote like support and it felt like it was a support from like a true place in me. It wasn't just mechanically. Yeah, but this will all pass. It wasn't mechanically. It was really something organic that happened. So just first writer, I just emptied, put words to it, turn the page, dear Jessica, breathe, relax. And then just words of support to myself that helped when it was really dark. Totally. That is such a great tip that I wasn't expecting someone to share tonight. We've done this in coaching calls before. I think we did it in a group session, Jessica. I think you might've been in that call, Lifestyle Integration. I made every single member, everyone had to write a letter to themselves. And it's something that's so powerful when things are tough. And the best part about it is what needs to come out comes out. You know, what you need will just come out intuitively. You don't even need to try. It's just like... Your body and your mind and your brain knows what you need. Your soul knows what it needs. But I love the preempt to that, which is empty the bin first. You know, like just get it all out. You can't write a nice loving letter when you're still pissed off and frustrated and angry. So you're just journaling, yeah? You're just literally thoughts on paper. Is that right? Yeah. And I think that for me, it was really, because I know there's also methods where you're just emptying it. You're just writing it out and then you put it aside. But for me, it was for some reason really important to just meet myself from a more loving part because mm. it was just heartbreaking to be in that position it felt so small and helpless so finding that wiser voice the knowing like and just i've missed you jessica <laughs> you. <laughs> so good <laughs> so good hey charlie what comes to mind for you i just think that's just so impressive jess honestly it's really lovely yeah. i think it's amazing yeah it's just yeah so for me, I think what I learned to do, which helped was to allow myself to feel what I needed to feel instead of sort of, you know, kind of distracting with outward stuff. So I would perhaps, you know, allow myself more restorative time. So that might be sort of journaling or meditation or, you know, some really restorative kind of yoga. But none of this was like never massive stuff, you know, maybe 10 minutes here or 10 minutes there. So I just would do kind of like little bits and often and it was kind of a way of sort of like loving myself and allowing myself to sort of heal you know so, sort of like an inward hug if you like love that uh, love that the, the in it's the working in again you know it's that working in versus working out thing and that was massive for me actually you know that whole idea that what you put out you need to put back in because of course that was what i never did I well, just people people, people places don't really do that do they I just, yeah, it was just constant out, 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 you know. Give to the um, that, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be the superwoman. My, you know, I remember a big one for you was with kids. 
I remember that you felt like you had to really be there for them all the time and care for them, even when they weren't even asking for your care. Do you remember that? We had a huge break. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's honestly, it's still part of me, you know, where I just feel like I just need to, you know, be there. And what I've learned is that actually them watching me love myself and look after myself is far more valuable especially to you know I think I've mentioned my daughter you know she's 21 and it's like watching me grow up as I did you know this random kind of out 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 sort of thing and so you know she now sees me sort of take time for myself set boundaries heal love myself value myself be patient with myself you know all of those things and that's so much better for my kids to see that powerful yeah yeah and you're glowing you know, feel I'm, about it, to it I'm about to cry. I'm about to cry. I just remember how hard it was for you, you know, and it's just like, it's I think, a, you know, like, to not be able to look after that. I, I don't want to cry. You know, cry if I can get through a Zoom without a tear, that would be a miracle. <laughs> but as a mum, for me, mm. the, the shame that I felt not being able to do what I felt I needed to do for my children and to actually feel responsible for all of the things that they weren't managing because it must have been my fault because I wasn't parenting them properly you know because I wasn't available because I was tired but it's really tough Empower. but actually the best thing I did was learn to, to look after myself because I'm so much more available yeah. and there's no resentment it's just kind of you know because that was another thing you know I was so exhausted so exhausted all the time and then I'd be grumpy because somebody wanted something else <laughs> which obviously I'd already offered. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we had some tough conversations, but just how empowered is that? You, you're coming from a place of empowerment, you know, and I think before it was coming from this like place of frustration and lack. And, exactly, and, lack. Yeah, it's a yeah. really good word. Yeah, and just yeah. so powerful. Yeah, B, what comes to mind for you? Thanks for sharing, Charlie. <laughs> for me as well, it was probably a combination of the two. Like, I cried a lot. I am a very smiley, positive person. And I think that was very important for me to, you know, do that kind of self cheerleading and I remind myself very rationally, like that even if I felt like I was alone and isolated and this was never going to end, that I had all this rational proof that it wouldn't. But at the same time, as I think that kind of positive cheerleading for me was super important, I did also cry pretty much every day for like years. But not all day, every day, but like probably once or twice a day, you know, and then it would, I would feel it all and then I had felt it and then I could feel better again. And I think for me, that was a really big one. And also be able to learn how to cry in front of people in my life. So not just like have to hide it and be like, oh, yeah, but, you know, recovery's going great. And, you know, it's all good. And, you know, I'm making progress and then secretly go cry. I would cry on the phone to my friends or my parents, like with my partner, because I think that was also for me very important to be. I don't have to hide the fact that this is hard because it was hard. So I think that and then just journaling, I do the same thing and it's so good. <laughs> I also think what helped was noticing that it was the same things that came up again and again. Right. When I did the journaling of feeling all the things every time it was like, I'm never going to get better or like I'm alone or like my friends are going to leave me, <laughs> whatever it was, mm. but it would kind of go and repeat. I would eventually notice. And then I'd be like, okay, hang on. I've worried and been sad and upset about the same things for like years, but they have never happened. <laughs> and then you can write back to yourself in a supportive way. So yeah, I think a bit of a mix of things yeah I, I just think that's so important to feel it too to not pretend that you have to like kind of what Jessica was saying at the beginning like not managing recovery perfectly also emotionally right to constantly be upbeat about it like no <laughs> you mentioned it's hard yeah the difference between understanding and knowing it's hard versus talking about how hard it is all the time is two very different things Right. We had a member this morning say, oh, this is great, but it's so hard to do. I pulled that person up and we had a conversation with uh, our guest speakers, two types of people, <laughs> the people who are doing really well at life and succeeding and writing books and building homes and starting yoga retreats. It's hard, but they don't talk about it. 
they know it's hard and they continue to show up and just do what's necessary to move forwards. Yeah. Versus the other person says, oh, I really want that, but oh, but it's just so hard. And oh no, I can't. It's too hard to write the book. I just, you know, I can't do it. And so just want to kind of bring that to the awareness too, of really totally great to acknowledge that it's hard, super necessary, but maybe not that enhanceful to talk about how hard it is all the time. What factors made the biggest impact in your recovery? Charlie, I'm going to throw it to you. I think partly I learned to be patient. So I stopped running everybody else's race because certainly part of it for me was I was worrying that I wasn't doing as well as other people. And it's that whole perfectionist thing in us, isn't it? Where we think we should be somewhere by a certain time and that person's there and I'm not. So it really all ties in with me, with the value stuff, because I learned to be patient and to trust myself as much as I trusted your process. There was no race. Yeah, yeah exactly. Race. There's no race. It's my recovery. And once I learned to trust myself as much as I trusted you in the program, and I learned to be patient with myself as much as I was patient with every other person in the program. So once I started putting my love for everybody else in that process into me, it suddenly started to click because then I started to appreciate the value of looking after myself properly and kind of working out what it was that I wanted rather than what I thought I should need based on other people. It was a very insular process, mm. you know, with the benefit of such an external kind of gift, if you like. Yeah, I don't need to add on to that. That was perfect. Thanks for sharing. Amazing. B, what came up for you? Um, I like the S in factors, as you kind of probably expected me to say, <laughs> that there are multiple things. But I think the one thing, if I had to pick one, I'd say mental rest, which for me meant meditation, a lot of meditation, because if I was just lying down resting, my mind is quite a busy mind. So if I was like lying on the couch or in bed, having my allocated rest, but I wasn't intentionally resting my mind I would be thinking about how I was feeling I would be stressing I would be having lots of fear thoughts you know and that wasn't resting so I think that was the biggest factor was just learning how to call my mind when I was trying to rest my body which then the whole of me was resting right not just my body because if my mind was really busy my body was maybe lying on the couch but it was like tense you know it wasn't in a restful mode I didn't know the difference before I got sick. I had no idea what the difference was. And so learning that, actually learning how to rest my whole system was like the biggest factor. And it still is. I noticed that now in my day, like what you were saying, Toby, is how you do something, not what you do. Mm. Like, it's just so good. Yeah. And it applies to pretty much everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so brilliant. Hey, Jessica, what comes to mind for you? I can 100% agree with both Charlie and Dave about these things so with, with the mindset, relaxing, taking down the pressure. Uh, I want to add boundaries because to be able to set up boundaries, I have to kind of somewhere I have to have a small belief that I'm worthy of setting up those boundaries, that I'm allowed to say no. So work with that to, in a way of trusting myself, like Charlie said, trust myself to be worthy to say no, to be more me, because that's the thing. When I was constantly in this pleasing and overachieving mode, I wasn't me. And I feel that more and more that I will never go back to the person I was. I'm more like just now finding my way towards the person I actually am. Mm -hmm. So I would say the whole kind of mindset and boundaries. Uh, and also, of course, resting the nervous system properly. I completely agree with that. Mm, mm. Yeah. While we've got you girls here, and we're going to wrap up in a second, how did you get the most out of the program? What was it for you that helped you the most? Because I know there's a fair few people here who have just started the program. They might be six months in, they might be 12 months in. How did you navigate the program? What was the best thing for you? I know, Charlie, for you, you were on pizza calls. You were actively involved, but you also chilled out a little bit. You know, there was times where you just took a break and then you'd come back in a ebb and flow kind of way with learning, applying, have a cognitive break, come back, do the same thing. 
So just like a minute share for each of you would be amazing on this. I'll throw it to you, Charlie. I did the sort of ebb and flow thing, but I also was really consistent with my basics. So, you know, with my planner and my wins and my gratitude so that it would kind of tie me in every day to sort of remembering what I'd done that was working, even if it was a more difficult day. Yes, the baseline, sticking to the fundamentals, everything, yeah. learning inside the program. That's the whole point. It's not just the bad days that you can still do things that are going to help you. Just doing my best to do the minimum on the difficult days and then recording it so that it was there. Amazing. Love it. You now, B, you did the old program, so like it's like 100 times better like than it. what it was, but it was still good. I mean, it helped you, so it must have been all right. <laughs> It was very good, Toby. So I can't imagine what you guys are all having now, which is probably just incredible. Yeah, I think for me with the whole program, the biggest thing was learning to trust that if I was consistent and did all the components of the program every day consistently, then it would help and I could improve and recover. That was the biggest thing, the consistency over intensity. So I've taught so many Toby of those few phrases. They've been on like a vision board for like years and years. And I think, yeah, for me, that included things like even if I was going to a wedding or something that seemed really hard to do, I would still just do the same thing. So that, okay, well, this is when I rest. I'll go rest between the ceremony and dinner and I will go to bed at before dessert <laughs> you know like I would just make mm. it work consistency actually surprisingly could even take me to those events that I didn't think it would be possible because I just carried my consistency with me and then it worked very well so yeah, yeah. Moved you forward. it's amazing great answer Jessica just in 60 seconds what's your tips yeah consistency even the smallest little things just keep them consistent yeah. it doesn't have to be the big steps just small small like you say all the time Toby and then I think to allow myself to participate with a group because I have had fear and I have fear about taking up space this is a huge thing for me to show up for this call so to take up space to express and to use my voice to participate in the program with the other people because there's so much gold and there's so much connection and I have people in the program that I speak to every week now, like deep friendships. So participate and consistent, even if it's the smallest little steps every day. That would mm. be it. Amazing. Jessica, I just want to say you have done a brilliant job for someone who was very scared to take up space today. You've been absolutely amazing. And you're a natural. All three of you are actually naturals. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. While you guys were talking, I grabbed these cards and... This is the car that came up. <laughs> How crazy is that? Consistency over intensity. So these are quote cards that are kind of run through the program that we say. And uh, yeah, consistency over intensity. Hey crew, on behalf of Cedars Health and the members and the team, just want to thank you three so, so much for being here. You guys are just absolutely amazing and you're making such a difference in the world directly through your friends and family but also the wider communities by how you show up. So thanks so much. I appreciate it. We'll see you all soon. Au revoir. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks, guys. Hey, I hope this video was really helpful for you. If you haven't already, please hit the like button and feel free to leave a comment. What was your takeaway, your insight from today's video? It's really helpful to actually write your learnings down. We seem to embed it better and it seems to help us move forwards with life. Here are three ways we can help you right now whenever you're ready. The first way is make sure you add yourself into our free information recovery group on Facebook. We'll leave a link in the description below. It's a really supportive, encouraging place. There's no negative venting. You can ask questions to other people. There's something like seven, 8,000 people in there right now. And I'm sure by the time you're watching this video, there's even more. So go over there right now. We share success stories. We share our latest free trainings that come to the public. And we always share upcoming information about upgrades inside our program. And also when we offer free webinars or free information nights that can further help you with your own recovery. The second way we can help you, which is one of my favorite, is through all our free trainings. 
We're going to leave a link in the description with our favorite free trainings that we know can help you start your recovery, whether that's through our baseline training, which will help you stop pushing and crashing, our three stages of recovery to figure out exactly where you're at and know what to do next, or my favorite, which is our guest panel workshop, which was actually exclusive for our members. It was so damn good that I actually asked them, can we share this to the public? They all said yes, all five of them. So thank you past members. They share their five recovery secrets and it's really powerful. There's tears, there's aha moments, there's real key insight and inspiration. And so whether you're a one out of 10 and you're really struggling right now, or whether you're further along in your recovery journey and you're integrating back into life, we have you covered. The third way we can help you is through our actual paid online recovery program, the mentorship recovery program. And if you are interested in getting proper help, a holistic comprehensive plan, professional coaching from the best coaches in the world, whether that's with mindset, movement, nutrition, restorative movement, reconditioning, integrating back into life, integrative medicine, baseline, structure, routine, accountability, all things health and life. Feel free to apply for the program today. All you need to do is click on the form, cfshealth.com slash form, fill out the short two to three minute form application and the team will be in touch with all the details that you need to know about the program via email. So make sure you check your spam folder for all the free trainings. If you've sent through an application, please be patient. My team are real people, okay? They're not robots. So if we don't get back to you within seconds or hours, it's okay. <laughs> we will get back to you. If you don't hear from the team within two to three days, that means that it's basically gone to spam or junk and it's gone missing. So please send a follow-up email to the team at info at cfshealth.com. If you have any questions, go check it out. But I would highly recommend adding yourself into the free group right now. Go click on that link in the description. Go download all the free trainings. Honestly, the whole reason why this whole thing started is because when I went through this myself, it was so painful and so excruciating that I didn't want anyone else to have to go through it. And some of these free trainings are so damn valuable. Back then, I would have paid thousands of dollars for. We've had so many comments and emails and posts saying, oh my God, the baseline training was a game changer for me. Toby, I've been doing this now for three months and I'm feeling so much better. My symptoms are decreasing. I've got more stamina. I've got more energy. I'm able to do more things. So, you know, whether you're learning from us and consuming our content through our free format, I'm so stoked. Whether that's in our paid program, I don't really care. Either way, all I want to make sure is that you are moving forwards. You are starting to really implement this work. And that's really what it's all about. Once we implement, we make change and we start to move forwards. Sending you a ton of love. Of course, feel free to consume as much of the YouTube videos as you like. There's so many really, really great ones, new and old. Sending you a ton of love and uh, speak to you very, very soon. All the best for now.